Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. And tonight we're going to go over uh, my workflow for the Tulip Nebula. So I, I had captured about 24 hours total between the HA uh, S2 and O3. Uh, weather has changed again and it looks like it's going to be a while uh, before we get clear skies again. So I decided to just uh, go ahead and process what I have. Now, I did do uh, a couple things different this time around, so uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, if you're new to this channel, uh, please go ahead and subscribe, because I have a lot of different types of content regarding astrophotography on my channel. Uh, I do gear reviews, mostly the gear that I have, uh, and, uh, and I do workflow videos, and I do tutorials. Uh, the goal is to try to get a video for just about every image uh, that I uh, capture so that you can see uh, my processing steps. And the hope is that I can share some information uh, with uh, the viewers and through comments I can learn new things from my viewers. So it's a mutual uh, information exchange which is pretty awesome. All right, so the HA and the S2, I got a little over nine hours. Actually, I think I got just shy of 10 hours on each of them. And the O3 was just five hours. So the O3 I only took uh, when the moon was either not out or it was less than 30%. Uh, as the moon got bigger, I stuck with the um, HA and the S2. And the reason for that is that uh, HA and S2 are not as impacted as much as uh, O3 when it comes to the moon. I mean, it still impacts them. Contrast is hurt, but you know, I mean, if it's clear and and you know, it's not been clear for a while, you're going to go image even if the moon's up. <laughs> All right. So anyway, here's HA. All right. Not stretched. Not processed. This is just uh, stacked, and uh, it's pretty clean. Getting some nice detail in there. Here's our S2. As usual, S2 is not as strong as HA, uh, but S2 definitely sometimes gives you some nice, uh, interesting details in there. And they do show through. And here's a look at the O3. Not a whole lot, but uh, an important part because uh, uh, this area here in the center uh, does uh, give us uh, some nice colors in the center of this uh, nebula. It's one of the things I like about the Tulip Nebula. In, uh, in the Hubble palette, it can be a very colorful target. Now, I stacked all these in, uh, in um, Picks in sight, so they came out registered. I still had to do uh, crop to get rid of some star stacking artifacts along the edges, and then I ran dynamic background extraction. And so here's what the HA looks like uh, after doing the dynamic background extraction. So after dynamic background extractor extraction, I did my first deviation for my typical uh, workflow. Now lately with the advent of noise exterminator I've been doing all of my processing and then I hit it near the end with noise exterminator uh, and that seemed to have been a pretty uh, worked out pretty well. But uh, in the past uh, when I used to use like uh, TGV denoise and MMT denoise I would sometimes run the noise reduction before running deconvolution. So this was the first time I experimented with running noise exterminator before doing uh, deconvolution. And I'll do a comparison here with the HA. Actually, let me back it up here, yeah. There we go. So this is with noise exterminator. Now, I mean, it was already pretty smooth, at least in the brighter areas. If 
but maybe we can see a difference here. Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty noticeable, right? We got some noise up in this area, and it's all uh, smoothed out here. And if we go to a darker area, right? I mean, we can see that difference. Let's get it on the same section here. There we go. So yeah, it took the grain out, and uh, it didn't introduce any kind of artifacts. Uh, so my thinking was that if I did the noise reduction before deconvolution, uh, then I could perhaps be a little bit more aggressive in deconvolution and not worry about that um, those noise artifacts that you can sometimes get uh, running deconvolution. It, to me, it looks like an orange peel. Uh, some people say it looks like little worms, but whatever, it's an undesirable artifact. And doing noise reduction in the past uh, helped prevent that from happening. All right, so I, I ran um, noise reduction against all three, right? So you can see I got an NR at the end here. And then I ran deconvolution. We'll stick with HA as the example. And this is what it looks like with deconvolution. Let's get the uh, DBE back in there. Oops. All right. There we go. Had trouble with the mouse pointer. I don't know. Yeah, have you guys noticed the older you get, the uh, less accurate your mouse clicks are? <laughs> Maybe that's why I stopped playing video games. Okay, so I think we can see here pretty good. I mean, so the left is uh, with deconvolution and the right is before. And there's a pretty substantial difference here. In this area in particular, the detail is much improved. And uh, also notice how the stars are looking better. Now this star over here, right, uh, is a little cooked and probably what I could have done was masked it uh, when applying the deconvolution. But you got to also remember this is, this is an auto stretch, right? So it's a pretty harsh stretch. And uh, when everything's said and done, this might not actually be that noticeable. So, yeah, I think uh, the noise reduction with the deconvolution worked pretty well here. Now, one thing I was a little concerned about uh, is that sometimes if you do noise reduction early, uh, you could end up with kind of this moated look in some of the fainter areas. And so I was a little concerned about that. Uh, I figured if, it, if that happened, uh, I'd have to go back to this stage and run deconvolution uh, before doing the noise reduction. Okay, so after running deconvolution on all three, uh, it was time to do a channel combination. And here it is. This is still not stretched. This is with uh, unlinked channels. And uh, I just use the LRGB combination tool. So uh, LRGB combination tool created this image, image 188, and uh, I stretched it, and then I removed the stars. So I did it two different ways. Or I think, no, so I removed the stars, and then I applied uh, SCNR to remove some of the green, and I ended up with this. All right, so this I think had left too much green, and this left just enough so it, you don't see it too strong yet but it's in there all right so I made a copy of that and I moved over to another workspace uh, to start so here we have it uh, is um, 188 a clone of a clone of a clone <laughs> Now, I wanted to get more contrast out of this, and so I used a tool I don't use very often, uh, but I might try to um, use it 
work it into more of my images. And that is this one over here, this uh, HDR multi-scale transform. Now, these are the settings that I used. If I reset it, here's the default. And basically what this does is it's going to increase the contrast and it's going to make everything look a lot edgier. Um, but it, it, uh, it's very powerful and it can really um, overcook an image. Uh, so what I typically do is I'll run it a bunch of times to do a comparison. Uh, this over here, this number of layers is the main variable you're going to tweak. And the bigger this number is, the more gentle the application is. And you do want to click this preserve hue. Uh, that way it doesn't mess with the colors in there. So I created another copy and um, applied it to this. So here we can see the difference here. And this did a really nice job of pulling out all of this darker dust back here. And many of the uh, images of the tulip that I've looked at uh, in preparing for processing this, you, you don't see this uh, in too many of the images. So this became a very interesting part of uh, the image and I definitely wanted to preserve that. It ended up getting obscured a little bit by the stars, but it's there. Now I still felt that this was a little bit um, too harsh and uh, so what I did and and this is usually what I do with this is I just add these two together and it it produces an image it's a nice balance between the two and that's what we have here so we retained all the nice interesting uh, uh, structure to this dust back up in this area uh, but it's not this area is not looking so um, I guess too contrasty, <laughs> if that's a word. So yeah, I felt like this was a nice balance between the two. And so image 195, uh, the result of adding those two together is what I use going forward. So from this point on, it's a lot of work with curves and a lot of work with masks. So mask and curves, th those are the two main um, uh, tools that I use here. And I'll make color masks and range masks and all kinds. So let's just step through these uh, updates. So you can see I'm working on curves, pulling back uh, the, the darker areas a little bit. Now we have a mask on there. Okay, so the mask is covering that part. So I can do some more work on the background. All right, I'm always trying to keep these areas from getting too dark, and that's always a challenge that I have. Sometimes what, what ends up happening is I'll get tunnel vision, say on this, or over here, and I'm working it, and I'm not paying attention to how dark this area gets. Because, I mean, the thing with these uh, with, with dark dust is it like it looks like it's a hole, but it shouldn't be a hole. It's dust that's blocking light, so... I don't want it to look like a hole in the finished image. Now you can see that the mask is reversed. Oh no, this is a, this is a yellow mask. And so I'm doing some work specifically on this area here, which has a lot of interesting structure. And we should see some color changes. Yep. Okay. So now my regular viewers should be able to answer this question here. What, what did I do on this step right here? Right, so we're yellow, and now we're getting kind of orange and gold. Right, and so the answer is uh, with this mask in place, I just pulled back on green a little bit on curves. So I do have a video I posted uh, a couple videos ago where I specifically go over managing color. So if you're new to PixInsight or new to astrophotography, definitely check that uh, that video out. Especially on Hubble palette images, it'll really help you uh, uh, manage the colors and, and get the results that you're looking for. So anyway, I wanted to get more of a goldish, reddish look, right, instead of this yellow, yellowish green. All right, but I used a yellow mask so that I can preserve the green that's coming out over here. Remember, we didn't have a whole lot of green in here when, uh, when I started this, but... Uh, 
uh, increasing saturation uh, brought the green back. So there we go with some nice red. I got a mask on here. I did uh, mess around with uh, um, unsharp mask just on this area here. Taking some green out of the background here and some blue. Also, uh, Star Exterminator did leave some artifacts here on some of the biggest spots here. I actually created a mask to pull back on the color on that to make it a little bit less noticeable. And so this here is where I ended up uh, for the starless version. And it was at this point that I started to work on the stars. Now, I tried a bunch of different things with the stars, and I did a lot of uh, tweaking, and that's why you see all of this. But these are mostly minor tweaks. Most of the star work was done with this. So this is what the stars look like when I pull them off that original image 188, right after LRGB combination and right after the stretch. Uh, so, right, we got a lot of magenta in here. So uh, I pull back on curves, and then I invert. And I'm using the SCNR tool to remove green. That kills all the magenta. And why does removing green when it's inverted kill the magenta? Because the inverse of magenta is green. And uh, some more work. Increase saturation. And that left me with this. And then it was just a matter of putting them together. Now, like I said, I had a couple of different attempts with the stars. Uh, this was one attempt uh, and I thought the stars were too strong. Here's another attempt uh, and this is the attempt I decided to stick with. So I don't know which one which one looks better. It looks like this one is pulled back even more than this one and uh, this one has more stars. To, so it's like as usual, I always find myself going for the the middle of two extremes. <laughs> so anyway, that's my tulip. So it's a really cool object. Um, the Edge 8 with the 294 mono gets a nice uh, close-up view of it, so the image scale works pretty well. Unfortunately, there's a really cool object that's like right around here, a uh, suspected uh, black hole and a, um, a nice, um, I think it's a uh, bow shock uh, of O3 in here. So after the weather improves and the moon goes away, I might actually train the camera down just a little bit and, and focus on that for a time. Maybe. I'm not sure. I've not decided if that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but anyway, I'd love to hear what you guys think of this one. Uh, questions or thoughts on the procedure that I showed you and the final results. Uh, clear skies.